Hi, I'm Ranger Pete. I'm standing here at the Sunken Road on the Fredericksburg battlefield. Something we get asked here quite commonly from people is about why things were done a certain way. Uh, why generals made a certain decision, why soldiers acted in the manner they did. And before we kind of address that with facts and a real distinct answer, I think it's important to make folks aware of factors that existed uh, during the Civil War that they need to take into consideration uh, before looking more closely at all these uh, nuances of uh, why things occurred the way they did. Uh, it's natural to try to uh, consider things from your own perspective of what you know, but obviously folks in a different era had a much different context. Um, I usually point out three things that an, an individual should uh, consider before they analyze a Civil War battle. Uh, those would be uh, the experience and knowledge of the leaders, communications, and the capabilities or limitations on the weapons of the time. So let's start off with the leaders. In the Civil War, the United States Army only numbered about 16,000 soldiers before the outbreak of the conflict. Um, once the war began and they needed, you know, all these uh, armies to, to expand, they called out volunteers of which, you know, they would get hundreds of thousands of soldiers and they then needed officers to lead them. So if you had an individual who had been in the regular United States Army, had gone to West Point, maybe seen service in the Mexican War, that little bit of time and, and knowledge that they had would then turn them to be the most qualified candidate to be a general. So in the Mexican War, they might have commanded like a company or a battery of a few cannons or soldiers. Now they're in charge of a thousand or 10,000 troops. So what they were familiar with, they are now no longer because they're kind of put in a new in a new role. The lower graded uh, non-commissioned officers or company grade officers, so like your sergeants, uh, your captains, they were elected by the men. So, and that wasn't necessarily based on their military prowess. It was gauged on, were they popular? Did they have money to buy everyone uniforms? So their learning curve was, was, was pretty steep. And the United States Army had no doctrine on how to go about training all these new officers and soldiers. Uh, they didn't have anything in place like we might have today with the uh, ROTC program or the reserve program uh, set up. So, um, so when we wonder, you know, what were they thinking when they made this mistake on a battlefield? I, I wonder, what, what do we really expect them to do when we've almost set them up for a situation that isn't conducive to success uh, for them, um, all things being considered? Uh, let's talk about the communications in a day and age where uh, we're used to real time uh, learning about things as we see them uh, via satellite. A general can watch a battle take place today back in their command post. Um, that's very, you know, a uh, different picture for the Civil War where a commander is relying on their own voice. So if your soldiers can't literally hear you, then they're not going to be able to know what you want to do. And then if you're a general higher up the chain and you want to transmit an order, you know, it had to be written on a piece of paper, handed to someone on a horse who rode to the recipient and delivered it. And then if they wanted any clarification, had to ride back, which would take, you know, 30, 45 minutes or longer. That all also result, resulted in a lot of ambiguity. You're jotting down this order very quickly and the recipient doesn't necessarily understand what you're trying to say and has to waste time clarifying it or act on it immediately, just interpreting whatever they, they receive. So, and then lastly, the weapons of uh, the Civil War. A lot is made of the rifled technology, which had been around for a while, but now became more readily available to large numbers of soldiers. Uh, which is true, it, it increases the range and the accuracy of a weapon. However, the average Civil War infantryman who was handled, uh, who was handed a rifled musket, wasn't necessarily trained on how to best utilize its potential. They weren't given target practice or marksmanship training. Uh, the officers were not instructed on how to tell the soldiers to estimate ranges or adjust their sights accordingly. So you're putting in the hands of these soldiers a potentially deadly weapon up to you know 300 plus yards out, but you're not showing them how to actually maximize that. Um, same thing with the artillery, uh, right? A rifled cannon could pinpoint a target maybe a mile away, but those rifled guns t uh, usually had smaller projectiles, a smaller damage radius, so to speak. 
the most popular cannon of the entire conflict, which the artillerymen were clamoring for, was the smoothbore 12-pound Napoleon, a gun that could engage enemy uh, artillery or infantry at ranges under a mile, fire a variety of projectiles reasonably well, and had, you know, a bigger damage radius if you had an explosive shell or the uh, canister-type anti-personnel rounds. So, um, so I think if you can um, appreciate all those things uh, first, then maybe delve into some deeper analysis and uh, you'll get a more objective result, in my opinion. We use that for visitors who come here. We use those for military personnel who come here. Because again, it might seem like some common sense things, uh, but you got to remind yourself uh, that obviously it's a lot different uh, in 18, you know, 60, whatever, that um, we're not dealing with, you know, 2020 and everything that we're used to uh, in this moment. So.